Now, welcome to the broadcast. My name is Tony Muga. You also know me as Patrick Penry. I have a WordPress blog, and I have a YouTube site, and occasionally I'm known to do a show on blog talk, and I try to use free media because when you do, you can express yourself to the fullest without having any kind of reservations, and that's important to me, and, and that's why I'm basically on my own, uh, doing my own thing by myself right now. Now, tonight I want to dig right in and give you some background uh, because many may not be familiar with what Operation Mockingbird is, in particular with the mainstream. Uh, many of you who are searching the alternative media for answers to your questions are already somewhat aware that something's not right with the mainstream. And, and you know that these uh, spokespeople on ABC News and NBC and CBS, they they have people to answer to, and they're tightly controlled what they can and can't say. So many people are aware of that, but they're not aware of the Operation Mockingbird, which is an actual effort to uh, place operatives within the media who will represent the uh, establishment viewpoint, if I can put it that way. So what I want to do very briefly, or to begin with, is read a selection from an article on a website called whatreallyhappened.com, which incidentally did carry one of my original articles. And this is from an article by Alex Constantine. And this is a selection from this article. It's not the entire article, but I'm reading pertinent sections. And the name of the article is The Depraved Spies and Moguls of the CIA's Operation Mockingbird by Alex Constantine. So reading from the article. Operation Mockingbird was conceived in the late 1940s, the most frigid period of the Cold War when the CIA began a systematic infiltration of the corporate media, a process that often included direct takeover of major news outlets. And real quick, I'll point out, I often tell people about how ABC was bought out by Bill Casey and Ronald Reagan to quash a report by Peter Jennings on CIA drug money laundering in Hawaii. And thereafter, according to the article I read, they were been known as the CIA News Network. So there's a great example of where they go in and make a direct takeover of the entire outlet. They control and own it. They have controlling interest of shares in the stock. In this instance, it was Bill Casey. I, I think his shares dropped 6 or $7 a share, which is pretty phenomenal. And so because of the battle between Capital Cities and ABC News, the stock dropped and they got an even cheaper deal. And in the end, they have control over what is said or is not said on ABC News. Now, continuing along. In this period, the American intelligence services competed with communist activities abroad to influence European labor unions. With or without the cooperation of local governments, Frank Wisner, an undercover State Department official assigned to the Foreign Service, rounded up students abroad to enter the Cold War underground of covert operations on behalf of his Office of Policy Coordination. Philip Graham, a graduate of the Army Intelligence School in Harrisburg, PA, then publisher of the Washington Post, was taken under Wisner's wing to direct the program code named Operation Mockingbird. By the early 1950s, writes former Village Voice reporter Deborah Davis and Catherine the Great, which, by the way, is available on Amazon. I looked it up today. And uh, the book apparently does go into this infiltration into the mainstream media to some degree. Uh, I read briefly where copies were originally bought up and burned and destroyed, but the, the author, I uh, can't remember her name, uh, there it is right there, Deborah Davis, she won a lawsuit and the book was printed again, so something to look into. Uh, Village Voice reported Deborah Davis and Catherine the Great. Quote, Wisner owned respected members of the New York Times, Newsweek, CBS, and other communication vehicles, plus stringers, four to six hundred in all, according to a former CIA analyst, end quote. The network was overseen by Alan Dulles. You guys are familiar with him. I think he also oversaw the Kennedy um, Commission and the Kennedy assassination. Overseen by Alan Dulles, a Templar for German and American corporations who wanted their points of view represented in the public print. And that's very well said, because that is the objective of the Operation Mockingbird and the infiltration into all forms of media is to control the information. And by controlling information, you thus control the viewpoints of the public at large. If you 
only allow the public to know certain things, well, by logic, they can only form certain opinions based on what they are or more aptly not told. In the case in my instance, what I'm saying is they're not talking about a specific issue that is, in fact, a very, very serious issue. So that is the objective, is to control the flow of information. All right? And it's all about energy control on this planet. But to control energy on planet Earth, you first have to control information. To have a lock energy monopoly, you first have to control the information. Because the last thing you want is people to find out you're monopolizing the source of power, sources of power, and metering them out at top dollar, as opposed to allowing alternative forms like solar energy, and a lot of people don't know patents are being suppressed, and there's major alternative energy and new energy sources that are being suppressed. So that's the point, control information. Back to the article. Early Mockingbird influenced 25 newspapers and wire agencies consenting to act as organs of CIA propaganda. Many of these were already run by men with reactionary views, among them William Paley, CBS, C.D. Jackson from Fortune, Henry Lucy or Luce from Time, and Arthur Hayes Sulzberger from the New York Times. That's a familiar name to many people. Activists curious about the workings of Mockingbird have, been, have since been appalled to find in FOIA documents, Freedom of Information documents, the agents boasting in CIA office memos of their pride in having placed, quote unquote, important assets inside every major news publication in the country. It was not until 1982 that the agency openly admitted that reporters on the CIA payroll have acted as case officers to agents in the field. In other words, when a journalist is out in the field doing his reporting, one of the CIA agents is his handler, and he will instruct him on what he can and can't report on. And this is really, in a nutshell, you can see this in the movie Full Metal Jacket in the Vietnam War where the guy, Private Joker, he's writing for the Stars and Stripes, and... That is indeed the case there. His boss basically tells him, you know, there's some things you can and can't write about when trying to win a war. You may have to exaggerate, you may have to out and out lie, but you have to keep morale up to win the war. So basically the same premise there. In the 1950s, outlays for global propaganda climbed to a full third of the CIA's covert operations budget. Some 3,000 salaried and contract CIA employees were eventually engaged in propaganda efforts. The cost of disinforming the world, the world cost American taxpayers an estimated $265 million a year by 1978, a budget larger than the combined expenditures of routers, UPI, and the AP news syndicates. In 1977, the Copley News Service admitted it worked closely with the intelligence services. In fact, 23 employees were full-time employees of the agency. Most consumers of the corporate media were and are unaware of the effect that the salting of public opinion has on their own beliefs. A network increment in time of national crisis is an instrument of psychological warfare in the Mockingbird media. He is a creature from the national security sector's chamber of horrors. For this reason, consumers of the corporate press have reason to examine their basic beliefs about government and life in the parallel universe of these United States. And that's basically the summation of what I wanted to read from that article, courtesy of what really happened. Now, why is Plumegate a big deal? This is what we're going to, second part we're going to talk about tonight, is Plumegate, and why is it a big deal? Why is what is contained in NRC FOIA documents so critical and important? Why is it now that it's so, you know, maybe too late now, we're three weeks away from election? But had the system worked properly, had the alternative media function to its capacity, what you would have seen was uh, an effect much like probably during the Iran-Contra or Watergate within the mainstream media, because even in those instances, there was a lot of publicity, a lot of press, and, and you know, there's a, a lot of attention drawn to those two particular events. When you look at Plumegate, and by comparison, Fast and Furious, I, I like to say it was the approved conspiracy this year that we got to, well, you got Joe Arpaio talking about the birth certificate, but you know, one of the others was the approved conspiracy was a Fast and Furious, and it is damage mitigation, in my opinion, where the lesser of the two is allowed to leak, and the most damning evidence is hidden, hopefully, until the election is over and Obama can get 
and get back into office. And it's all theatrics, but the main thing is they want it to look legitimate to the American public, right? And if a big boondoggle of a thing comes up that hampers that effort, well, it makes the, the theatrics and the rigging of the election that much more difficult. So it's very important in that um, it happened on Obama's watch, and it's certainly indicative, if nothing else, of a president who's having a, you know, one of three things is going on. He's either lied and conspired to by everybody around him, all right, and, they, and they tell him, hey, there's nothing to worry about. You go out and tell the American public it's fine. No radiation is going to hit America. We have nothing to worry about. That's possibility one. Everybody around him is lying to him. And this is, this is not unheard of. I mean, when I took my political science class, we talked about Egypt. And at the time, this was, uh, what, uh, four years ago, four or five years ago, the time we discussed Egypt, and my teacher said that the president of Egypt, although he has power and he can do things, he's surrounded by a group of people that give him his information and tell him you know, his appointments and his briefs and all that kind of stuff. So again, he's subject to information control on a, you know, on a whole other level. And so by that, she said that he's only able to make certain decisions within parameters he's given. So he is controlled, and his... You know, he might not be given the uh, Egyptian public the truth at the time, but that may well be because people aren't being within his circle, aren't being honest with him, and he's being manipulated. The second possibility is Obama's just a complete buffoon and doesn't really know, doesn't know much about industrial disasters or radiation or nuclear or any of these things, and, you know, he's just a complete buffoon. And that's, that's not, we don't need that kind of present either. We need one who's concerned and attentive and up to date on these kind of situations. And the last possibility is completely in on it. He knows exactly what's going on. And, and although this has not been proven, and, and, and to be honest with you in the FOIA documents, there is no direct link to Obama. And I'll be perfectly clear on that, and I always have been clear on that, because I've seen some articles that were very sketchy where they were trying to imply that he's basically, you know, saying he must say something or implicate himself. Well, that's not the case. They're very careful to keep the, the highest, at the very highest level of the executive office, the present office, they've covered his tracks well. If you notice the press conference that Obama gave, uh, this would have been during the first week before he took off to South America, incidentally when the worst of the plume and fallout hit, he came out and made a statement that according to the NRC and other experts that we really had nothing to worry about. Radiation of any degree was not going to reach the West Coast. So he's very careful to clear himself of any possible loose strings or any ties to him. But within the documents is contained evidence of this grand conspiracy. I mean, there's multiple agencies involved. And even before this nuclear incident, you see they've already got their plans in place what to do if in the event there is an actual incident. So to keep in mind, these things don't just happen willy-nilly um, like Indiana Jones, we're going to play it by ear. They've got a game plan pre-prepared. Now, recently, as I was looking in the FOIA documents, I came across the Comanche Nuclear Power Plant Emergency Guidebook is basically what this thing is. And in the guidebook, there's even a flow chart of how the information goes, from what they determine in the field after an accident to the levels, the seriousness of the accident, particulars of the accident. It's all routed through informational channels. It's distilled. It's censored. And, in, and, and what their information is, is quite different than what the American public is eventually told. It's two startlingly different stories. And I, I expose this quite well in my Tales from the Script series, where I pull from the documents and I show you how they, their talking points is a good example, how they're given a preset of talking points and the questions and then their answers to the question. And one, one set of answers is for the you know, experts with the NRC and the others for the general public. And one will say that they'll, you know, when during a meltdown, the general public's response will be during a meltdown, there's nothing to worry about, there's really no discharges, and it's very innocuous. In the one for the experts, NRC, it says radiation may be released and all this kind of thing. So there's two totally different levels of information. And, and also besides just the whole organized, orchestrated, working together to obfuscate from the American public the fact that they knew about the radioactive plume and fallout. Now, this 
wasn't the first meltdown this planet has seen.